Cora TV. The world is thinking. You know, our story is um, dramatic, certainly. I mean, I, I started drinking when I was 13, and, you know, it started out very innocently. I was introduced to drugs, and very quickly what happened for me, to make a long story short, is my drinking and using got very large, and my life began to get very small, and all the things that were important to me started to fall off the side, and my parents did everything they could to try to help, that managed control including sending me to three treatment facilities and that last and I ran from everyone. <laughs> I ran from every facility and the last time I, I escaped I came to my mom's house and she came to the door and she said I am so glad that you are alive and you are not welcome in my home or in my life until you're living a life of recovery and if I never see you alive again I want you to know how much you will be missed. And she closed the door on me. So you can imagine your daughter is almost 18 and you take her up to Idaho in the wilderness because you know she can't run away from this place. She has no resource, no place to go. No one does she know in this area. So it'll be impossible for her to run. But, you know, four days later, out the door she goes in the worst snowstorm in 50 years with nothing but her clothes that she had on. I mean, she wasn't prepared to be out in the wilderness. So uh, when we got this call at 3 or 4 in the morning, it was, you know, in the middle of the night. And, of course, the terror um, that you feel when you don't know where your child is. And um, You've been already through many, many horrendous experiences. So that was um, like a bottom to me. You know, I just said, well, I can see I have no power here. I mean, I've tried three times. She won't stay in the treatment centers. Um, you know, we bring her home and she runs away and the pattern starts all, all over again. And I have three other children to consider and, and a husband and myself to take care of. And I just can't do this anymore. I mean, I can't get better while she's, while I'm living with this turmoil. And I, I just felt I didn't know what else to do. And it didn't feel like I was turning her away. It felt like I was letting her make her choices. Because I'd already been in therapy. I'd been working with uh, the treatment centers, of course, where she had run away from. So it wasn't, I was, it wasn't like a shot in the dark. Uh, it was just a realization that I was powerless and that she would have to make her own way and I would have to make mine. So that's how it felt. And of course, I didn't know what would happen to her after that, uh, which is a major part of the story. But uh, in the meantime, I had to get better myself. So after my mom closed the door on me, I descended into the depths of addiction. You know, I left her home that day and I did go out and make uh, a life for myself for a while. I mean, I had a job for a little while and I had a place to stay for a while. And, but as my addiction got larger, my ability to maintain those things became really impaired and eventually I became unemployable and so I couldn't keep my place to live and, you know, I ended up homeless and losing everything actually that was important to me. I, I did, I actually robbed homes for a while. It was definitely high stress employment. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I robbed homes, I, you know, engaged in thievery and Ill illegal activity and eventually ended up in the streets here in San Francisco, which certainly was a life-changing experience. And I did whatever I had to do to survive. I know, you know, I can tell you this, I did not draw a sober breath the whole time I was there. And eventually I was picked up for being drunk and disorderly, which always I thought was really, I didn't know any other way to be. <laughs> it was such a strange thing to be picked up for, but they picked me up and they, they brought me to a homeless shelter. And it was on the floor of this homeless shelter that I had my moment of clarity. And I was uh, dying on the floor of this shelter and I had this thought that I could disappear off the face of this earth and nobody would know.
I mean, nobody expected me anymore. Nobody waited dinner on me anymore. I didn't go to school. I didn't have a driver's license. I mean, I actually, I didn't, I didn't exist. I could have disappeared and nobody would have known. And I was only 21 and I planned on being so much more than a thief, a prostitute, a drug addict. I just planned on being so much more than that. So I didn't die on the floor. And I called my mom from that shelter and she said, you know, are you calling for treatment? And I said, I am. And there began our ascent into recovery. I mean, I did go to a treatment facility. I stayed quite a while. And then I lived in a van and began to put my life back together. And here I am today, 14 years later. But as you can see, the more I wrote uh, about this story and the more I talked to my mom about writing this, the more my mom wanted to be in part of actually putting this book together. So what started out as me writing it and inserting her ideas slowly morphed into mom and I co-authoring this together. And we would schedule appointments at night, uh, three, four, five nights a week sometimes. Uh, after my children were asleep and we would sit on the phone and uh, relive these years that we lost to addiction and it was a very cathartic time. I think we cried a lot. It was uh, extraordinary to do together and at the end of the year well, actually, end of about six months, we had uh, 315 pages of this uh, manuscript. <laughs>